So on the self-insured side, we have some significant differences here. Now there are some drawbacks. Notably, there's some rules around confidentiality that say the employer can't actually handle the claims directly. The employer has to farm out this responsibility for handling claims. And if you think about this from your own perspective, if you submit a claim for a drug that might reveal something about your particular situation, say an antidepressant or a drug for erectile dysfunction, you might not want somebody in your human resources department finding out about that. That would explain why they point at you every time you walk by or something in the halls, who knows? But you might not be excited about that kind of thing. So we don't submit claims directly to the human resources department or whatever the case. We have to bring in an insurer in order to address any confidentiality problems. We also need the insurer's expertise in helping us to figure out what a reasonable amount of money to set aside to cover off these costs is going to be. So this is where the administrative services only portion of the plan comes in. The insurer is not actually covering off any of these expenses. The insurer takes no risk here. Instead, the insurer just takes a little bit of a cut from the employer in exchange for handling of claims and for taking care of the estimation as far as how much money we have to set aside. These plans, these self-insured plans, administrative services only plans, are increasingly common. You'll find a lot of ASO, and even today smaller companies will ASO some of their services. What you won't see generally, you won't see life insurance as part of an ASO plan, but almost every other portion of a plan, including in some cases long-term disability, can be covered under an administrative services only plan. Smaller employers tend not to put their disability portion on an ASO plan, but it wouldn't be uncommon to see the dental portion covered under an ASO plan or to see prescription drugs covered under an ASO plan. In those situations with dental and prescription drugs, we have a fairly predictable set of costs year over year. Now, the employer might look at that and say, okay, that's great. I don't mind handling those predictable costs, but I also recognize that something could go wrong, that on the drug side, I might have an employee who ends up with a prescription for a very expensive experimental drug, something that maybe a regular plan would cover, but we don't want to end up covering. So insurers will offer the employer what's called stop loss insurance. We'll tack in a stop loss policy here, and that stop loss policy would only pay benefits at a point when the claims reach an excessive amount. So most years you wouldn't use your stop loss insurance, you would only use it in years where there's an unusual amount of claims. So the self-insured side then becomes fairly manageable if the employer is willing to take on the risk, they can even pass on some of the risk by using this stop loss provision. There are some other advantages to self-insurance. It can help to manage the administrative costs of the plan. Um, we generate some tax efficiencies using the self-insured portion. However, that really falls outside of the scope of this course. It is something you might be aware of, but it does fall outside of what we have to learn for the purpose of the Life License Qualification Program. Now, just switching gears back for a second to the fully funded plan, so where we have an employer paying premiums as part of a fully funded plan, there are some things that insurers will do to make this more attractive. For a, a mid-size or a larger group, 100 or more employees, let's say, and it depends from insurer to insurer, I don't want you to get the idea that that's a hard and fast rule, but maybe for 100 employees or more, an insurer might offer a plan where the employer can have a fully funded plan but can take some of the risk of changing premiums out. What we might use here, we might use a plan which builds in what we call a claims fluctuation reserve. Be careful when you say that, you don't want to say that too fast. But we are going to build in this plan with a claims fluctuation reserve. What this claims fluctuation reserve does, it represents a slightly higher premium than what you needed to pay 
But the advantage for the employer now is that we've paid a little bit more premium. If our claims are going to be higher than expected or even lower than expected, what happens here is we've built up this reserve and the insurer actually will use that so that we don't have to go back to the employer and tell them you're going to have to pay a higher premium because you have more claims than expected. Instead, we would dip into that claims fluctuation reserve first off. So this is designed to kind of smooth out the changing costs of insurance over time. If the claims fluctuation reserve gets too large, then we actually refund some of that back to the employer, which is why we sometimes refer to this as the refund method of accounting. When we don't have a claims fluctuation reserve, then we use what's called the non-refund method of accounting. In the non-refund method, claims are going to cause the premiums to fluctuate year over year, and the employer might be dealing with some uncertain costs. And that's not necessarily attractive for employers. It's useful when you're thinking about servicing group insurance to think about the employer's perspective. And if you're in business, and you will be once you're done this course, possibly, depending on whether you're going to be self-employed or employed, but if you're going to be self-employed, then it might be useful for you to think about how you'd like your business to look. And most people who are in business for themselves would prefer to have nice steady level income and nice steady level costs to match that. It can be very difficult to manage a business where income and costs move erratically. If the employer then knows exactly what they're dealing with year over year, if we can build them some predictability, that generally is an advantage for them. Okay, so we've taken a few minutes here to look at how group insurance can be funded, some of the different funding options, and it gets quite a bit more complicated than this, but we've looked at the basics here, and this should give you a, a sufficient overview for exam purposes, and really even a sufficient overview to start doing group insurance business when you're licensed and out in the industry. So good luck, and hopefully you'll rejoin us for the next in our LLQP video series. Thank you very much.